You've been referred for an ablation procedure for a condition called atrial fibrillation or AF. What is atrial fibrillation? In order to understand what this is, one must understand how the heart beats normally and how electricity controls this. Your heart is made of four chambers, one, two, the atria, three, four, the ventricles. The heart normally beats because electricity starts at the top of the heart over here and comes down to a little structure in the middle of the heart here before coming down to the bottom chambers like this. Now that's normal. Now in all of us, we have four veins sitting in the top left of our heart. And these veins normally accept blood returning from the lungs back to the heart. But they are also important because they are the source of further electrical firings to the top chambers of the heart as such. Now in some patients, these firings from these top from these veins can result in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation describes the chaotic, hazardous, haphazard, fibrillatory activation coming in the top chamber. And because this is completely disorganized, it means that the bottom chamber cannot follow or recognize this electrical signal from the top chamber, resulting in a fast, an irregular beating to the bottom chambers of the heart. Because these top and bottom chambers are out of sync, it can manifest with breathlessness, dizziness, palpitations, and fatigue. Now, you have been referred for an ablation procedure for this condition. An ablation attempts to stop these firings coming from these four veins. It, in, it, it tries to do this by either burning or freezing around these four veins to then isolate these signals coming out to the rest of the heart. Now we know that in those patients who are coming in and out of atrial fibrillation, by doing this procedure, we can significantly reduce the burden of their fibrillation such that Patients can come off medicines that they are taking for fibrillation and be without symptoms in up to 70% at one year. For those patients who are always in atrial fibrillation, we call that persistent AF. This ablation procedure can allow them freedom from fibrillation off medicines in around 55% at one year. So how do we do it? Well, in order to get access to the heart, we have to go from your groins. Your arteries and veins are both communicating with the heart and we use the veins specifically. The veins in your body are under direct connection to the top right of your heart over here. We put local anaesthetic and some tubes into these veins and bring catheters which allow us to study the electrics within the heart and also equipment that allows us to deliver ablation through these tubes up to your heart. Now, these veins communicate with the top right chamber, but these pulmonary veins or the veins linking in from the lungs are on the top left chamber. This is the right, this is the left. In order to get to the left side of the heart, the doctors have to make a small hole to get across. Once they are in this chamber, it takes about an hour to deliver the treatment that is required. Once the procedure is done, the, all the catheters are taken out of the body and this hole will eventually seal up with time. The procedures are performed in the cardiac catheterization laboratories, where you will be greeted by a, your doctor, consultant, nursing staff, physiologist, and radiographer. You will lie on a table, which will allow us to visualize both the heart and the catheters inside your heart under X-ray, as well as the electrical signals within the heart. At the very beginning of the procedure, or we may consider doing a special camera test 
to have a look at the heart in more detail. This is called the transesophageal echocardiogram. This allows us specifically to look at these top chambers to make sure there's no clot sitting inside the heart. Clot can sometimes form in a little outpouching sitting on the top left of the heart, which we call the left atrial appendage. As long as we're satisfied that there is no clot sitting in the heart, we can proceed with the case. In some centres, this is excluded in advance using a CT scan. The doctors will then get access to the heart as described. We'll perform the procedure going across from the right to the left of the heart, deliver the treatment as described, and the procedure is completed once we are certain that the electrical signals from these veins are no longer escaping into the chambers of the heart. Sometimes we wait a period of up to 20 to 30 minutes to confirm that these signals are no longer there and may even give you medicines to try to stress the heart in order to confirm that the ablation that we have done has been robust. Once the procedure has been completed, if this was done under general anaesthetic, you will be woken up. You will then be returned back to the day ward where you will be looked after by a recovery nurse. You should expect to stay in overnight and go home the next morning. In some centres, these procedures are performed as a day case procedure, and therefore you should be aimed to discharge the same day, but you will need someone to escort you home. Now these procedures are performed very frequently, and it's generally very safe. Indeed, this is one of the most common ablation procedures performed in current practice. However, this procedure is invasive and is not without risk. We quote around a 3% risk of bleeding complication down at the groin. That includes the need to have a blood transfusion or rarely vascular surgery to repair any problems with the vessels down below. Up inside the heart, the risk of complication is individually around 0.5 to 1%. That includes causing a tear in the wall of the heart, causing blood to leak outside the heart into a sac. If that happens, the blood can constrain the pumping action of the heart, and we would have to put a drain in to take that blood away, or rarely proceed to heart surgery. There is a risk of damaging structures around the heart. That includes your food pipe, sitting behind the heart. The nerves supplying your diaphragm. The veins themselves. And the gatekeeper of the heart, which may require an artificial pacemaker fitted at the end of the procedure. The risks of these are around 0.5%. In most of these, we will know immediately once the procedure is completed. The one which we will not know for certain is with regard to injuring the food pipe at the back of the heart. Once the procedure has been completed and the nursing staff are satisfied, depending on local policy, there will be a discharge protocol. Critical to that will be the restoration of the blood thinning medicine that you are taking. It is absolutely empirical that you adhere to the blood thinning regimen that the doctor recommends as it is in this post-ablative period that without your blood thinning medicine, the highest risk of clot formation in the top of the heart can occur and the risk of stroke exists. Please follow the advice given by your local doctor as to how that will be. To expect after the procedure. One can expect to see I experience some degree of discomfort at the groin and notice some bruising. If you notice any active bleeding or any significant worsening discomfort, then please seek emergency attention. Towards the heart, one can experience a degree of discomfort in the chest. That can either be because the ablation procedure has inflamed the skin of the heart skin surrounding the heart. 
this can usually settle with a simple painkiller. In the first three months after the procedure, you may still experience palpitations and you may indeed go back into atrial fibrillation. This is not failure of the ablation. Over the first three months after the ablation, the ablation itself causes the heart muscle to go through a period of change from a period of swelling to eventually forming an area of scar. Whilst the heart muscle is swollen, it can still cause extra beats to fire into the body of the atria and cause you to have atrial fibrillation or other forms of atrial arrhythmia. Indeed, for the first three months of the procedure, we call this the blanking period because we blank in our eyes and in your eyes what happens as a marker of the efficacy of the ablation. It is because of this blanking period that we recommend you continue all the medicines that you were taking for your atrial fibrillation. And when you are seen in follow-up clinic, at that point, depending on your symptoms, your doctor can decide to withdraw any additional medicines that you may be on. Whilst we are hopeful that we can help your symptoms significantly, many patients require more than one procedure for atrial fibrillation. This is not a cure, but is a means of reducing the burden of fibrillation that you're getting. The reasons to have more than one procedure include either that the ablation that was done, whilst acutely successful, a region where the ablation was delivered, the electrical signal can recover, allowing little signals to come out again into the body of the atria. Alternatively, in a small proportion of patients, fibrillation is not driven by firings coming from the pulmonary veins, but elsewhere within the atria that may be required to be addressed on a redo ablation procedure. For any additional information that you require on atrial fibrillation ablation, please seek further advice from the Arrhythmia Alliance.